Yes, my colleagues, now I'm going to present the topic, the clinical relevance of ultrasonography in anterior compartment defects. Uh, actually, if you got an ordinary, a simple ultrasonography, you can do a lot of things regarding pelvic floor evolution. Uh, to tell the truth, you don't need a very sophisticated one in order to get a rough idea. Uh, surely, the integrated approach is the ideal way, but you don't need to be worry, worrying regarding if you've got a simple one, because a simple ultrasonography can do the main things that you would like to do. For example, you can do a dynamic study, you can see the uh, levator ani or puborectalis muscle activity, or you can really evaluate the perineal activity, or you can really can have an idea regarding anterior apical or posterior compartments. But the best way is an integrated approach. Uh, it's, it's for sure the right way. What can we visualize with a transperineal sonography or translabial sonography? There are four important topics, I think. The first one is the stationary incontinence. What can we see? What we should look for? The second one is the urge. And the third one is the pelvic organ prolapse. And the fourth one is the fecal incontinence. In order, for the sake of clarification, I just want to go through a little bit further on that topics. For stress urinary incontinence, there are four main issues that we should search for. The first one is the funneling of internal urethral meatus on valsalva or rest. Another important data could be gathered from the retrovesical angle evolution. Another one is the bladder neck mobility. Another one is the fixed urethra. But briefly and frankly speaking, none of those parameters are well correlated with the diagnosis of stress urinary incontinence. That's very crucial. I mean, if you, let's say, measure a retrovesical angle greater than 120 degrees, does this really mean that this that special lady has stress urinary incontinence? This is completely no. The answer is no. But it would give you a rough idea, or it would also give you that after the treatment, if you measure, if you compare the uh, data before and after, you would be seeing that, oh, something I did correct, and the healing procedure has already been verified with our ultrasonographic findings. So, to make it again clear, none of these parameters are directly correlated with stress urinary incontinence, but they have a high proportionate of accordance with the problem. Another point is urge urinary incontinence. Actually, thickening of the bladder wall, if it is over than 5 millimeters, it has a very well coordination with urge urinary incontinence. But according to the integral theory, the mechanism and the treatment of urge urinary incontinence is quite different from what the ICS or IUGA have been saying. Because there are two paradigms in the world now. One is integral theory and what the other one is the ICS Ayuga uh, paradigma. So according to them, urinary incontinence is another issue and according to us, urinary incontinence is a other issue. Pelvic organ prolapse, uh, that's very well correlated but I, I, I should say if the organs are moving beyond, below the reference lines, then 
we would surely say that that special ready has rectus cell, anterior cell, or sister cell, or so whatsoever. And fecal incontinence, it has already, it has already uh, has something to say. I mean, the ultrasonography, we can show the thinning disruption of internal or external anal sphincters and before and after the operation you can really objectively document it that you heal the patient through surgery if you do the measurements before and after. Let's look at the pitfalls of imaging. First of all imaging is performed in dorsal lithodom position with the hips flexed and slightly abducted. And if Valsalva is a problem for the special patient, if she's very obvious, let's say, then transperineal ultrasonography can be performed at standing position. Obviously, this is very difficult for, a, uh, for the one who is performing the procedure, but this can be done. Placement of heels close to the buttocks will often result in improved pelvic tilt. That's another important issue. So if you make it closer, uh, you'll get a very anatomical pelvic tilt, so it would be more easier to do some special measurements, let's say something like hiatus of the women. Prior voiding is preferable because we know that if the bladder is full, uh, a special, that special lady sometimes does not want to push as forceful as possible due to the fear of leaking. Actually, we want the patient to leak, but sometimes it happens, so we, we really want uh, a prior voiding. Rectum also should be emptied. Parting of the labia will improve the quality so that's what we are calling translabial, actually. Another important fact is that the image quality is dependent on the hydration state of tissues, best in pregnancy and poorest in the elderly women. So doing an ultrasonography in a pregnant woman, as you see, is very, very easy to easily locate the tissue differences. Uh, but there's an important drawback, which is vaginal scar tissue, uh, it can really reduce the quality of vision. Obesity is not a problem at all regarding tissue vision. I think the most important part uh, for the beginners to the pelvic floor ultrasonography is the image orientation. Uh, you see, it is uh, very much, not very much different, but upside down, the, the, the presentation, I mean, Julius' presentation, I think he prefers the other way around, but that's what I've been preferring. Uh, in this image orientation, this symphys pubis is on the left, it's cranioventral, and the anorectal canal, it's dorsal caudal, it's on the right. Uh, so I really like to do like this. In the bef uh, before, uh, in the first session, a friend asked, a colleague asked whether uh, she could see this cervix or not. Yes, you can see it. It's very clear to, to be seen. Uh, here I just want to show you the details. Uh, this is a hand drawing and this is the uh, ultrasonographic appearance. Um, here you see the urethra and here you see the vagina. I think the air bubbles is the most important part of locating the vaginal uh, space. You should see that. Once you see it, it you, you should locate that, oh, this vagina, so it makes things very easier. And you see the rectum is here and here you see the Pubarectalis muscle indentation to the vision. Uh, and below all, you see the uterus. Again, I'm telling the same important thing. Image orientation is the most important thing when you are beginning to a pelvic floor ultrasonography. 
I would like to go a little bit further. The standard mid sagittal view, what we see, here we see the symphys pubis and this urethra and air bubble filling. You see the vagina tissue and here is the rectum and it's the levator animal and uh, namely it's puborectalis uh, muscle. If you go a little bit further or deeper, you see we can easily locate most of the structures very clearly. Uh, here you see again the distal urethra, it's here. Symphys pubis is here. You see the urethra and here you see the bladder. Just below you'll come to see the uterus and again the airfield structure which is vagina. As you see, this is very interesting. Sometimes it could be very easy to locate a facial plane. Actually I do I do accept what Julio said in his presentation. It's not easy to locate a facial plane, particularly the rectovaginal, the denon villiers fascia. And also, it is the true. It is the same story for the uh, vesicovaginal fascia as well. I mean, you cannot easily locate the vesicovaginal fascia between underneath the bladder and the vagina. So, but if you come, if you go laterally, you might be you might be locating vesicovaginal fascias. But when you come to the connection size, uh, it's quite difficult to locate or to say that this uh, facial plane or whatsoever. So here, uh, you can really get a rough idea regarding the facial planes uh, of the female pelvic floor. If you go a little bit further, again you see the vagina, it's, it's here, and underneath it, this is the rectovaginal space, and here you see the anal canal, and this is again puborectalis muscle, you see the indentation of the muscle group to the hiatal system, and here upwards is the perineal body, and urethra and the bladder, and again the symphys pubis is here. If you look to the axial view pointing cranioventrally, now the structures that you are going to see is the urethra and the vaginal plane, it's here. It's again a facial plane and now the anal uh, canal. But here you see a butterfly appearance, you see that? This butterfly appearance uh, roughly would say you uh, the iliococcygeal plane of the patient. If you look at the, the pelvic floor pointing dorsocaudally, you see it's very clearly shown to you in the previous presentation. You see the anus, it's here, and you see the external anal sphincter, and this is the perineal body, and here is the puborectalis muscle as well. So just changing the position of your uh, probe dorsocaudally or ventrally, you can really locate very important structures. Of course, you first know the, the anatomical normality, then you should go for the abnormality. If you look at the anal region, you see here is the external anal sphincter and it is almost white and just underneath it you will see the internal one, it is the black and then you come to the anal mucosa, it's here, uh, so white, black, and anal canal, this trilogy should be remembered in every time when you are doing an anal regional ultrasonography. 
Let's talk about a little bit the dynamic measurements of bladder neck at rest and with Valsalva. Regarding pelvic floor ultrasonography, this should be the part of your procedure. You should ask patient to squeeze or to push or Valsalva whatsoever in order to compare what happens when a pressure applied to the pelvic floor. First, uh, to define first, the one, the, the first one is the retrovesicular angle. It's here, here, as you see. This is the urethra, and this is the bladder, and this is the uh, line drawn just underneath the bladder plane. So you should measure this angle. Uh, I, I'm going to show you in detail. The other one is the bladder neck mobility. Although it is not very directly related, I've been telling the same thing, you should know uh, the bladder neck mobility while, while evaluating a patient of stress urinary incontinence. The easiest way is here <coughs> to locate the bladder neck. Once you locate it, it, it becomes very easy and also you should locate the symphys pubis, symphys pubis is here and the lower edge should be lined and the bladder neck should be defined so if you do this at rest everything is going to be very easy so let's go a little bit further it's here you see uh, the posterior uh, angle this retrovesical angle should be measured under Valsalva maneuver, it's here, you see it's getting, it's increasing and if the angle is above 120 degrees, you might say that this increase could be a, a diagnostic tool of stress urinary incontinence with ultrasonography. But this is not always the case. Please don't remember, don't forget this. You can get this value, you can get this data. It has some relations, but so far actually there is no direct relation with this angle measurement. You see it's in the rest and it's in the strain position or valsalva position. It's being measured. Bladder net descent, that's very important. You should locate the bladder neck, it's here, and you should draw a line under the edge of symphys pubis, and you should measure this, this, at rest. And then you should measure this under optimal valsalva, if you can do that. So, what you should do when you measure this figure, let's say it is A, A centimeters, and we should measure this under optimal Vasolva, let's say this is B, and if you subtract B from A, the difference should not exceed 30 millimeters or 3 centimeters. If it exceeds, it means that there is a urethral hypermobility, but Urethral hypermobility does not always mean that that special lady has stress urinary incontinence. So, um, I'm just trying to say you that these are data from ultrasonography, but those are not very much directly related to the uh, stress urinary incontinence itself. Here you see the measurement. Uh, I couldn't have a pointer actually, it's here. You see this symphys pubis and a line is being drawn like this and this bladder neck and you see it's being measured and this is at rest position and it's now under stress or under Vasalva. Now symphys pubis is here, you see a line is drawn uh, 
from the edge, lower edge of the symphys pubis. Now bladder neck has already moved upwards. So that's very important. If the bladder movement is upwards through this line, then you should regard this measurement as minus, minus centimeter, okay? Because you are over the reference line. So what is important, let's say this is A, and this is B, A subtracted by minus blah, it add them. This is, this is basic mathematics. Now let's look at here, uh, this measurement is 20.7 millimeters at rest. And this measurement is, since it is upwards the reference line, now it is minus 18.2. This is a minus, so what you should do, you should add both. We know that. So the result is 39.1 millimeters, which is more than 30 millimeters. And this shows that that special lady has urethral hypermobility. And we know that urethral hypermobility is more or less related with stress urinary incontinence. But I'm saying the same thing again. It doesn't mean that every urethral mobility is directly related to stress urinary incontinence. You can say that. Another important thing is the puboureteral angle. This has already been shown to you. It should be measured at rest and at valsalva. And according to this, the angle, the angle, as you see here, should not exceed 35 degrees. If it exceeds, it means this could be uh, a positive relation with uh, stress urinary incontinence, but not very uh, direct relation. Now let's talk about a little bit the 2D transperineal ultrasonography for the evolution of organ prolapse. As it has already been told by Julia, you know, this is the reference line. The reference line is passing from the inferior edge of symphys pubis. So we are measuring the upper edges or the, the prolapsed edge of a special organ. So here you see this is the bladder, and you see the symphys pubis line or the reference line. So I just draw a line, and I ask patient to uh, have valsalva, and under valsalva or at valsalva, I measure the upper edge of the prolapsed organ. There's one thing important. We know that. There is a good relation between the quantification system and transperineal ultrasound. So that's very crucial for us. And also, we should know that the measurements below or caudal to the symphys are negative or positive regarding being its caudal or cranial. Uh, and also, Symphys pubis is the main anatomical structure regarding drawing a reference line. So if you look at, there are two important things. One, the sand of the bladder to 10 millimeters or more than that. Uh, the sand of rectum, 25, uh, sorry, 15 millimeters or more than that are strongly associated with symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse and also they have already been proposed as cutoffs for the diagnosis of significant prolapse and ultrasound 20 sorry 10 millimeters for cystocell and 15 millimeters or greater than it for uh, rectocell and also this is another important scene as you see this is bladder, this is symphys pubis is here, then this is bladder neck, this is at rest position, and under valsalva you see the, uh, the edge of the bladder has already increased a great deal 
amount of uh, number so she's got a real cystocele and also the bladder neck has moved very much upwards and it's the same story for ectocell as well the symphys reference line should be drawn and the upper edge of the prolapsed organ should be localized then it should be measured and for rectocell if this is upper than or greater than 15 or that 50, equal to 15 or greater than it it means it is a rectocell or at least very much associated with the symptoms of rectocell another important topic is the anterocell it's the herniation of the small intestines through the defect between uterus and the rectum. And sometimes you can see anterior anterocell as well. Don't forget this. Then it comes in front of the uterus, which is very, very uh, small regarding a figure. Uh, but you can see that. Here you see the herniation of an anterior cell. You see that small bowel anterior to the rectal cell. And it's also here you see the anterior cell is increasing under the Vasalva action. I would like to say another important thing about. Um, measuring the residual volume while doing a pelvic floor ultrasonography you should learn this one as well of course don't forget this residual volume should be measured after voiding you see in one plane this anterior posterior and this left to right uh, just measure them in centimeters and multiply both and multiply this with 5.6 then subtract 14.9 millimeters so you got the residual volume for most of age 50 millimeters is okay and for elderly it's a little bit higher uh, it should be below than or uh, smaller than 100 milliliters yes that's all what I'm going to tell you regarding the uh, pelvic anterior defects